Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Steve Hankey. Steve is a professor of applied economics at the Johns Hopkins University. He is also, among other things, the director of the Troubled Currency Project at the Cato Institute. Steve has advised the U.S. and other governments on economic policy and monetary reform. He played an important role in establishing new currency regimes in Argentina, Estonia, Bulgaria, Bosnia, Ecuador, Lithuania, and Montenegro. Steve joins us today to talk about hyperinflation. Welcome to the show, Steve. Good to be with you, Dave. Let's begin by asking the question I ask all my guests. How did you get into economics? It was when I was an undergraduate at the University of Colorado. I, I got received my degree in business School of Business Administration, but I was essentially taking all finance, and I also took quite a few courses in marketing, and the marketing group was quantitative and pretty much economics, actually. Mm-hmm. I really got in the deep end, though. The second year, I was a, a graduate student at the University of Colorado. And then my second year, I was the head TA. The, the chairman of the department, Professor Guernsey, called me in uh, right, right before the semester was starting in the fall of my second year and said, uh, we, we just have news from the Colorado School of Mines that the, the professor of economics there had, had dropped over a fatal heart attack. And, and this was like 10 days before school was going to start. And, and they had to have three sections of principles taught at the Colorado School of Mines, which is in Golden, Colorado. Professor Garnsey said, Steve, they, I, they, they need somebody. He recommended that I, that I do it. I said, this, this is a killer. I, I said, I can't teach three sections of principles commute to Golden and and take all my regular, my second year, I hadn't even taken my comps yet. And and Professor Guernsey was wise enough to say, he said, well, you, you can do it. And, <laughs> and he, he then said, and you will learn a lot of economics too. So so I, I, I loved it down there. The students were fabulous. So simultaneously, while I was a graduate student, I was a, a assistant professor at the Colorado School of Mines, and uh, I, 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 lear- I did learn, Garnsey was correct, I, I learned a lot of economics teaching principles. I taught the first courses that were ever taught at the School of Mines in petroleum economics and mineral economics. I, I was just on the faculty at Mines three years because I, I finished my PhD then, and and I, I was offered a job at Hopkins and came to Hopkins. And, uh, that experience, an in-depth experience of the dual thing of not only doing graduate studies, but, but then being responsible for teaching principles and petroleum economics and mineral economics that's a school of mines. I, I really got into it uh, and ramped up in a hurry. I think I got the right field. Now, Steve, you have done commodity trading in the past, and is that related to this background in mineral economics and, and the mining school? Well, it's it, y- yes and, and no. Y- yes, of course, because uh, commodities, uh, uh, mm-hmm. oil and gas, uh, as as well as is is all the base minerals and even the precious metals are they're all connected to things that we were doing at the, the Colorado School of Mines, but the commodity trading part actually started when, when I was probably more or less 10 years old because my grandfather was had, had a number of businesses, but one business he had was uh, candling eggs. And for those who aren't familiar with what that's all about, uh, in those days, you, you would you had a truck that would go around and collect eggs every periodically from the farms and and bring the eggs in to be candled. Now, what that means is in the old, old days before my time, you would put a candle under the egg to see if it had any defects you can, because there, you can see through an egg if you have light underneath them. 
in 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 my day, of course, there was a light bulb uh, under and, and a little uh, in, uh, under what in effect was a box with a hole in it, and you would put the egg on top of the hole, and you could see whether it was was any good or not. And and then you would you would throw away the bad eggs, and you would grade the eggs and case the eggs and clean them and so forth, put them in cold storage, and until you got a, a, a at least enough for a, a semi full of eggs that you would ship back to New York. I, this was in Iowa, by the way, Dave, where I grew up on the farm. So what was I doing when I was ten? I was I was h- hanging around my grandfather, and and he, he showed me. Then there was an egg contract on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And he was hedging eggs because you'd have this huge warehouse full of eggs, and and if you thought the if you thought the price was going to be going down, what did you do? You sold the eggs forward on a on a futures contract, which existed then. It it doesn't exist anymore. So I I, I started hedging, and and knew what that was all about, and it, of course was going to. All of the grain markets and, and cattle markets, hog markets in Omaha and Chicago, with, with my grandfather. So I, I knew I knew how markets worked very very well, and auctions. I, I knew how an auction worked at a very young age. At about fourteen, I opened my own account to start trading, and and first started trading soybeans. This was in the like the mid fifties. This would all be, of course, illegal now. Can you imagine? A, youngster 14 years old uh, opening their own account trading so i i started then and and then and then there was a university period and and the colorado school of mines shall we say getting some theoretical context of markets and and so forth but my my tacit knowledge as polini would say was was very high i i knew how supply and demand curves work believe me uh w- without ever seeing a supply and demand curve before i went to university and and then i went along doing my own thing until 1985 when i became uh the chief economist of friedberg commodity management in toronto they, they trade foreign exchange and commodities at that time, Albert Friedberg uh, is the uh, the top man there at Friedberg's, and and it was a wonderful experience. I, I'm retired from uh, that now, uh, from Friedberg's that is. But we were trading everything, and the first big trade that that I did was in 1986, and, and uh, with uh, of course Al, Al Friedberg and and the rest of the people at Friedberg's, we analyzed the market, and I had kind of a plain vanilla mark, uh, 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 model for the oil market, and, and the conclusion from that model was that OPEC was going to collapse, and I, and I anticipated that the price of oil would go down below $10 a barrel. Well, it did. It turns out we, we had a huge position short in oil. We, we had about uh, in every kind of contract you can imagine, but when I say huge, very huge, we had probably seventy percent of all the short interest in the London market in the gas oil contract, and and we were also short the Saudi Real, and we were also short the Kuwait dinar, and all, all ships came into port. We, we we had a huge trade and and very successful. That that was really my first formal experience with, shall we say, managing client money, not, not my own money. And, and uh, I, I continued to do that for actually many years. And, and, and now, I, now I just do my own thing. Interesting. Well, let's talk about hyperinflation. You've become something of a hyperinflation expert. You've constructed the well-known Hanke Bushnell hyperinflation table that chronicles. You've gone out, you've done the hard work, you've chronicled um, hyperinflation cases, and you have three criteria for including a hyperinflation case in your table, and we'll make the links to these tables and these papers available on the, on the website. But the three criteria is, number one, inflation has to be at least 50% per month. Number two, this 50% has to last at least 30 days. And the third criteria is it has to be fully documented and replicable. And you mentioned in your note that's probably the hardest one. 
And before we get into the table in, in great detail, let's just talk about hyperinflation, You know what it is. Um, now, I think p- people know hyperinflation is a huge increase in prices, but, but why do we care about hyperinflation? Why is it so destructive? What does it do to one's life? So what is it, why, do, why would a person want to care about hyperinflation? Well, if you're in a country that's hyperinflating, the, any, in, any cash that you have, or, or uh, in most cases, assets denominated in, in whatever that currency happens to be, with a hyper with a hyperinflation, the currency is uh, massively uh, depreciating and losing value. Mm-hmm. So, it, so it's it's really a form of government theft. I mean that that's the easiest way to think about it. I mean it's inflation in general is a means of government theft not government taxation. I mean, taxes are, are, are something that uh, are uh, approved in, in at least democratic societies. They, they go through the, the normal legislative process and they're, they're, they're approved and voted on and so forth. Inflation, no one really votes for, for this. So it's kind of a stealth tax in a way, but, but really in that sense, it, it's theft. And, and and so what what you have with hyperinflation is is theft on a uh, on a grand scale. I mean, the, the highest hyperinflation occurred actually in uh, 1945, 1946. Uh, the actually July of 1946 in Hungary was the the highest ever recorded inflation rate, mm-hmm. and and. The daily inflation rate was 207 percent, which meant that prices were doubling every 15 hours. So, That's so that amazing. gives you some idea of the right. magnitude of the theft. I mean, if you if you had a, a foreign in your pocket it, in the morning, it, it, it essentially was it, it disappeared by the by evening. Yeah, there's many stories of, of individuals in Latin America. I've heard one story in in Brazil, for example, where You'd go to a restaurant and you'd sit down to eat, look at the menu, and the manager of the restaurant would li- be listening to the radio, listening to prices. And by the time you're done eating, your meal could have doubled, tripled in price. You didn't know what you were going to pay. Now, obviously, that changes your incentives for eating out. Also, people race to the, you know, they spend a good part of their day just racing to the market, uh, get paid multiple times a day so they can convert their, their paycheck into hard currency or some kind of physical good. So, I mean, hyperinflation on the on the individual level is very uh, destructive in terms of it, it misuses your time, your talents. You're spending a lot of resources trying to battle hyperinflation as opposed to being productive, um, enjoying leisure with your family. Um, so it's it's a definitely a, a big challenge. Now, let me ask this question. You know, we talk about hyperinflation, and and you know, people typically think of it as you know, lots of money being created. You mentioned it's a way of a theft, way of government you know, financing its operations. Um, but typically when hyperinflation emerges, isn't it a symptom of deeper problems? It's, it's not, in other words, it's not necessarily a central bank, you know, run amok. It's not like, you know, suddenly the central banker suddenly gets a, a desire for lots of inflation. Usually it's, a, it's something deeper, right? The state has collapsed. There's some kind of deeper um, state problem. So can you speak to that? Yes, that, that you Put your finger on the, the important aspect of hyperinflation is that it, it really starts, it, you know, Milton Friedman always told us, and he's correct, of course, that inflation everywhere and at, at all times is, is a monetary problem. You, you, you've mm-hmm. got the, the money supply exploding on you and you have inflation. So. So that that is true. There there is a, is a nexus clearly, uh, and, and causality occurs between increase rapid increases in the money supply and inflation. No question about it. That, now the question is that you're getting at. Well, why does the money supply increase so rapidly? I mean, do do central banks just decide that they're going to goose some money supply and 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 rev it up? And the answer is no. They they don't. Uh, it, it's a fiscal problem. Mm-hmm. And this, the fiscal problem is, is, is as follows, and, and this, in all these 
now 57 cases of hyperinflation that, that actually it, it was uh, Charlie Bushnell did help me with the Venezuela uh, hyperinflation. That's the 57th. But be, before that, we had 56 cases. And, and uh, in the Routledge Handbook uh, of major events in economic history, you, you can find that Hanky Cruz hyperinflation table. That, that's essentially the official table for all these things uh, that have occurred. And what you find out, Dave, it's, it's a fiscal problem. It, is at the core of the, of the problem. And what happens is that for, for one reason or another, uh, the, the state can't collect enough taxes to uh, finance or government expenditures. And, and they, they also can't go to the foreign bond market to issue bonds. And they, they, they can't go to the domestic bond market. They've tapped that out for, for any more financing. So to finance the government expenditures, what do you do? You, if you're the minister of finance, you, you go over to the head of the central bank with, with a, a nice offer, a, a nice package of bonds from the government. Of course, you've got a pistol in your other hand. And you say, I just have a wonderful deal for you. <laughs> buy these bonds. And the, and the central bank governor says, yes, well, I really have no choice. I will buy the bonds. And they buy them by crediting the account of the government. And, and the government keeps its spending going. In, in, in Yugoslavia, where I was the, the chief advisor in the, in the Markovic government, this is 1990 to uh May of 1991, when the Civil War started in Yugoslavia, uh, Yugoslavia was was a case that did have hyperinflation. They'd had endemic inflation for 20 or 30 years, but they they hyper started hyperinflating when they were financing about 95 percent of their of their total government expenditures were were credits from the central bank. Hmm. So it's so it's big time, and when when you hyperinflate, it means essentially that all the government expenditures are being financed by the by the central bank in most cases. The it, the one I know in detail is Yugoslavia. That actually uh, was a hyperinflation that that peaked in June of 1994 at at 300 million. January of 1994, excuse me, January of 1994, and the monthly rate of inflation, it, it, it exceeded 50%. Remember, that was a threshold for hyperinflation. Right. And, and we get that from Phil Kagan, Professor Kagan's work. That, that's why it's the, it's the norm. That's what economists use. You, you wonder where the 50% per month threshold comes. It's, it's the Kagan work. And, and, and so that's standard practice and procedure in the economic profession to use that number. But Yugoslavia, the rate, the monthly, was 313 million percent a month. Staggering. And, and, and that means that the price level was doubling every 1.4 days. That's amazing. So in the case of hyperinflation, we've actually had a case, arguably, during the Revolutionary Wars. We had some hyperinflation in no, the no, U.S.? No it, no, it didn't qualify. It didn't, it didn't qualify, last, okay. It didn't last long enough. It, didn't, it, it, it was very high inflation, but it, technically it didn't qualify and it can't be documented. It is not one of the 56. Okay, so it was high, but it didn't last the 30 days. Is that right? It didn't last 30 days, and, and there are lots of writings. This gets mm -hmm. into one thing interesting in the literature day. There, there are lots of monetary cranks, basically, Mm -hmm. they're, they're right about hyperinflation, and they, they call all kinds of high inflations hyperinflations. They, they never were hyperinflations. Okay. Some weren't even close. But the, the continental case in the U.S. was, was close, but, but it, it didn't qualify. There were, there were only a few days where the, where the monthly rate went over 50%. All right. So I guess my question is then, was the revolutionary effort financed in part through this process? 
yes. Okay, then here's another another follow up question. Then, could the Revolutionary War have been won without this hyper, we'll call it hyper, but this high inflation financing tool? Now that's a tough counterfactual question to, to answer, but I'm it, yeah, I'm it, curious. it is. Well, it, yeah, it, it's it, you know if, if we want to go counterfactual, I mean this 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 is counterfactuals. Of course, are just nothing more than fiction. Right. But but of course they they could have gotten more money from France. I mean France was okay. basically paying the bill, and if they if they could have gotten more money out of France, they they wouldn't have had the hyperinflation problem. Or, or alternatively, by the way, if they if they could have gone to the international bond market at the time and, and financed it, uh, that that would have been a possibility. The problem is uh, the big part of the international bond market was in London, and we were at war with with England. Well, that was my question. Could the Continental Congress have financed through more um, bonds? My, my my impression was they probably couldn't. They're right there. Uh, a, a colony in, in rebellion. They couldn't collect taxes very effectively, so they were kind of forced to, you know, finance the inflation. It, it depends. Uh, it, you you don't know. I mean, they, they again. If if what mm-hmm. if what if France would have uh, would have offered some kind of in effect collateral or or a, a, a backstop on paying? Well, that's an interesting thought. I mean, the, the the main reason we were, mm-hmm. we, we, you know, the, the the most people don't realize because the, the, you know the the French were the big supporters of the of the American Revolution. Of course, they were arch enemies of of England, but but the fact is, the French were the big ones, not only financially but but intellectually and and also uh, with. Uh, Military, strategic advice, and so sure, forth. Sure, sure. Well, let's let's go back to this point we mentioned earlier that hyperinflation emerges because the state has collapsed, or alternatively, as you phrase it, it's a fiscal problem. Something happened. Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe is a good example. He slowly destroyed the country's you know capacity to produce, and then resorted to. You know, inflation, printing money is a way to, to finance it. Um, part of this process, though, also is expectations, right? So, in other words, even if Mugabe, let's say, were to completely cut the printing press, or anyone who's, who's in this process, it still takes some kind of credibility to get off of that. So, in other words, the velocity of money itself could continue to circulate rapidly, which is based on the fear of future hyperinflation. So, you have a real credibility issue there. And and I'm I'm wondering, even in, like, normal times, like take the U.S. today, we have relatively low inflation today, and that is conditioned in part on our belief that our government's finances are sound, right? That, in other words, if, if, we, if, if the market began to expect that we were going to start running huge deficits or maybe some of these unfunded liabilities really are a serious problem, would we begin to see inflation take off even in a stable system like ours? Maybe. Mm-hmm. But it, it may be, but it it it, it, it again uh, depends on the extent to which the cent- the Federal Reserve, the central bank, uh, accommodates uh, the, those fiscal deficits that that would be gen- that you're conjecturing about. Right. And 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 maybe maybe the government can keep going into the bond market at a big time. I mean, maybe maybe it could be like Japan. I mean, Japan's debt to GDP ratio is, is way higher, even though the U.S. is, is at a peacetime record level right, right now. It, it it could go up much much higher to reach the Japanese levels now. How and Japanese the Jap, Japan has no inflation. They've they've been suffering actually from deflation, mm-hmm. and, and why? Well, they 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 sell JGBs. I mean the, the the bonds. They can finance it with bond financing. The the Bank of Japan isn't financing it. Right now, yeah. My my question is more, you know, if we were to ever cross that threshold, so we don't know where that is. I agree. Japan is pushing that frontier out farther and farther. But if the U.S. government were to pass some threshold, yeah, I mean, their, their, their debt to GDP ratio, you know, it's more than way more than double. Right. 
right. in the United States. I mean, it's massive. But there's some point at which people would begin to freak out, right? That the government can't fund its operations. It will be forced to monetize debt. Um, and at that point, my, my point is, even before they actually begin monetizing the debt, right? The, at some point, there's some threshold where you, you get so much debt that the market, the public begins to expect debt monetization, that the velocity of money could pick up rapidly even before the printing press is turned on. Is that, is that a fair assessment? I mean, it, 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 the expect you know, it, w if you're saying that, that, that expectations in, are important, I, I completely agree. Confidence and expectations are very important because, because what what would happen if, bef before the you know so-called printing press gets turned on in, in your scenario would be there there'd be a crisis in confidence and and the U.S. dollar would start tanking. Yep, and, and the U.S. dollar tanking would, would, would by, by definition, uh, lead to some increase in inflation. So that would be, that would be one channel. But, but, but again, also, it, it depends on what happens. Remember, most of the money produced in, in the United States that has any real effect on, on nominal growth in GDP or nominal aggregate demand, about 80% of it's produced by the banking system mm -hmm. it's outside the Fed. I mean, the, 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 the outside the, the central bank. So you, you, you have to work the expectations into how is it going to affect banking and, 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 and credit to the private sector that's produced by the banking system, as well as it might be that the private banking system itself starts financing a, a fiscal deficit. Mm -hmm. and, and in that case, what happens? Well, the, the broad money supply starts going up. Mm -hmm. to, and it confirms your expectations. And, and, and right. you, you do, do get more inflation in the system. And it is hard to envision a... but. It is hard to envision larger and larger fiscal deficits not being associated with uh, weak currencies, more inflation. So I, I, I agree. However, you say the public. Now, the, the public, you're, 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 I assume you're talking about the mean value of the, of, of the public. But in fact, there's a distribution. And, and, and there, the distribution would include people like gold bugs, for example, who, who completely got the, the, the last Great Recession episode completely wrong. They were talking about hyperinflation right? as the Fed expanded its balance sheet, but, but they, they, they were ignorant of the fact that what drives nominal GDP and nominal aggregate demand is broad money. And, and at the time Lehman went down, uh, about 90% of the broad money was produced by the banking system. And, and the banking system in the Great Recession has been highly, highly regulated with, with Dodd-Frank and, and Basel III capital requirements and so forth that have essentially put a lid on the production of bank money. And, and that's why we have quantitative easing. That's why the balance sheet of the Fed has grown so much because the, the private production of money has been, uh, it actually declined after Lehman. We actually had a decrease in that component that 90% that of the money supply was, was decreasing. And so the Fed stepped in and increased its, its, its role in producing state money. And, and if they hadn't, we would have gone into a tremendous recession. Uh, I mean, depression probably. Yeah. No, I, we, that's the point we brought up on the show before that there was actual an actual contraction in the money supply, just like there was in the Great Depression that many observers missed. Many folks look at him, too, when they should be looking at a broader measure of money, and they would see that. I guess my point, though, just going back to what I was trying to say, is that inflation, you know, we often think of it as just being a purely central bank operation, but it's always conditional upon a sound fiscal condition. In other words, it's easy to see a failed state, the fiscal policy role in Zimbabwe. But even in a, in a safe environment like ours, it's only safe because we got sound fiscal position, right? We, you know, it, it, our, our, 
our, our our inflation is where it is because we got a treasury that that you know that can take care of itself. I mean, we're not worried about large debt monetization in the you're, future. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, and 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 the best way to see it, it, it is it isn't really thinking about Zimbabwe. I I, I think if you think about the, the a, a lot of the hyperinflations that we've had uh, occurred after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And, and why was that the case? It, it was all a fiscal thing because we, under communism, there weren't any taxes, okay? They didn't even have a tax system, okay? Because the state owned everything. So they, they, they didn't have to tax themselves. They, 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 they could finance themselves with, with all state-owned enterprises because everything was state-owned. So then communism collapses. And, and the government keeps spending money, but, the, but they had no tax administration. They didn't even have a tax system. So there was almost no way to raise money to finance the government expenditures because in, in most of these new countries, they couldn't go to the international bond market. They didn't even have a local bond market. And, and so they, the only thing they could do is, is, is take the, 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 the paper that is the bonds over to the central bank and, and, and tell them to finance them. And that, that's what happened. So, so that's a very clear example that people can get their head around and understand, oh, this is the way the fiscal thing works. Interesting. And, and the ones before, by the way, were most of the other hyperinflations were, were during periods of war. Where, where you had great dysfunction and in, in it, it's basically the collection of taxes. You can't collect taxes very effectively. The, the bond markets all break down, so you can't use the bond markets. And in the meantime, you're in a war and, and you have to be spending a huge amount on material and, and, and in the war effort. Yep. Now that's very, that's a great example. And, and But it, it's it's interesting because most people you know don't think through those Think through those examples, and that's why your work is, I think, so helpful. You list these examples and provide, you know, a handy reference. Your table, that the Hanke Bushnell table, has fifty-seven uh, countries that are documented with hyperinflation, and you list them in order of size. You know, how large were they? And you mentioned just a few minutes ago that Yugoslavia was the greatest, and that's probably maybe a striking observation for many, and because many of them would suspect that Germany in the early 1920s, the, the, their hyperinflation, that's probably the best known one. But I want to read an excerpt from your paper where you, you speak to this, that their hyperinflation, in fact, is number five on the list. You would think it'd be, you know, maybe number one, number two, but it's actually number five. And you have an excerpt here. It's really fascinating. You put the most famous and well-known hyperinflation episode is the Weimar Republic's German hyperinflation. It peaked in October 1923 at 29,500% per month. That, that's a lot. But you go on to say this rate is many times below Zimbabwe's November 2008 peak hyperinflation of 79.6 billion percent. So Germany had hyperinflation of 29.5 thousand percent and, and Zimbabwe had 79.6 billion percent in November. And you put that's 80 followed by nine zeros. Um, you go on to say, but Zimbabwe's hyperinflation was only the world's second highest. It was minuscule next to Hungary's July 1946 peak monthly rate of 41.9 quadrillion percent. That is 42 followed by 15 zeros. Um, that, that's a pretty staggering number. Um, it, it, it's hard to actually work with them, to tell you the truth. I, I have to tell you that I'm fooling around with this stuff with my assistants. You know you, 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 you know, you have to double check all the time and see what you're doing and how many no zeros you're in. Yeah, that, that sounds like a challenge in itself. Now, quickly, tell us, how, you have a way of, of getting at these numbers because your third criteria is actually, as you mentioned in the paper, one of your hardest is actually being able to document and replicate these numbers. And you often, if not most of the time, use the purchasing power parity technique. So tell us about that. Well, uh, Purchasing power parity technique is is one now that I I, I use uh, monitoring, for example, Venezuela, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 that is one in which 
you, you, the most important price in, in any economy is the exchange rate. So, so the most important price in the world right now is what? It's a dollar euro rate. That, that is the most important price in the world. The most important price in, in Venezuela is the, is the Bolivar dollar rate. And, and where do you get a free market price of the dollar Bolivar? Well, you have to go to the black market because the, the government has controlled rates. So they aren't free market rates. So you have to get a free market price of an exchange rate. And, and in a place like Venezuela and many other places, you have to go to the, a parallel market or, or a black market to get the exchange rate. You look at the, the delta or change in the exchange rate over a, a period of time, let's say a year. And with purchasing power parity theory, you, you can work out the arithmetic and and, and and get and can estimate or, or calculate, measure, if you will, an implied inflation rate associated with the change in the free market or black market exchange rate for the currency that's involved. And, and so that's that's how you do it. And it's, at high inflation rates, it is absolutely spot on. It's very very accurate. And, and, and one of the, the, the breakthrough articles that, that uh, makes this very clear, actually, is, is an article Jacob Frankel did in 1976. And, and Frankel was looking at data from the Weimar. And, and if you look at that data, uh, the, so he had the exchange rate data and, and measures of an, the inflation rate. And if you put the, the the, the, the graphs on on, on a, in, in a quadrant the, the the two the two lines for the changes in the exchange rate and actual change actual measured in changes and in, in prices are they're, they're identical they're just one on top of the next and and if you work out the theory of it purchasing power parity should work at very high interest rates now the, now the thing is most of the literature on purchasing power parity it, it's looking at changes in the inflation rates in two countries and, and trying to predict what, what will happen to the exchange rate. Well, now I flipped the thing around, con contrary to the literature, still using the same theory, and I, I'm looking at changes in the exchange rate and calculating an implied inflation rate. It's, it's very accurate at, at high inflation rates, and the intuition is, is as follows. As the inflation rate starts going up, people mentally switch out of their domestic currency because it's it's it, we went over some of these cases. You know, if you if you have prices that are that are doubling every twenty four hours as they were in Zimbabwe, how, how are you going to keep changing the prices of peas at the store? You know, right. If they go up that fast, you'd have to have a, a somebody running around with labels, you know, slapping them on, <laughs> on there every hour or something. You gave an example of somebody eating, having a hamburger or, or meal at a restaurant, and the the price of the meal is changing as the guy's having his dinner. So, what you what people do is they 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 to figure out the value of anything. It will be nominally priced in in the local currency, maybe. And and let's say in bolivars and in, in Venezuela, it'll be priced in bolivars. But the guy at the grocery store, when you go to the cashier, assuming it's not a control price, what what price will he charge you for the can of peas? Well, he'll look right away at what the black market exchange rate is. And, he, and he'll convert the value in Bolivar, uh, the value in dollars in, into Bolivars and charge you that. So, so they're looking at the black market exchange rate all the time. And now it's very efficient because, of course, you have apps on your iPhones and everything that give you the black market exchange rate instantaneously. But, but people in high inflations, Dave, they, they, they start 
not only literally spontaneously dollarizing themselves and, and using the dollar, but where they're forced to use a local currency like the Bolivar, they're thinking mentally dollars and, and the Bolivar dollar exchange rate. And, and that's why purchasing power parity works to perfection at very high interest rates because everyone, in fact, is is either dollar based or whatever their anchor currency happens to be. It's usually the dollar, but not always. I mean, some sometimes, for example, in Yugoslavia, it was a, a German mark at the time in 1994. Mm -hmm. So, so the Yugoslav thing was is is a fantastic story because in the morning, where they issued a, a 500 billion dinar note. This gets into why you have to be re-denominating your currencies very rapidly in a hyperinflation. Otherwise, you end up with, if you don't re-denominate, you end up with a, what I call a wheelbarrow problem. You, you got to have a wheelbarrow full of notes to buy a hot dog. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very inconvenient. So, so what's the government do? They're hyperinflating and they keep adding zeros all the time. So, so you don't buy the hot dog with a wheelbarrow full of currencies, but, but at least for a little bit of time, you, you might have a pocket full of them and, and, and you'll be able to use those. So it's, a, it's a convenience factor. So they were adding zeros, adding zeros in Yugoslavia. And finally, one, one morning they, they added the uh, more zeros and, and the 500 billion dinar note came out. And that was worth about five marks in the morning. And it, it, was, it was worth almost nothing at night. Hmm. So what do you, what do, you do? You, 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 you would have to re-denominate again the next day. But that means you've got to go to the mint, and, and, and the mint has to be re-denominating and producing money and distributing new notes constantly. And what happened, the, the top cider mint was a very good mint in Yugoslavia, very, very high quality bills and, and so forth. And finally, they were running that thing 24-7, and, and they just couldn't re-denominate fast enough. And, and the hyperinflation collapsed. And, and the reason the hyperinflation collapsed is once you can't re-denominate, and that's a it, this is a physical constraint. On the system, the physical constraint caused the hyperinflation to collapse because the dinars that were outstanding, those 500 uh, billion dinar notes, by by two or three days, were worth li literally zero. So, so what was the real value of the monetary base, at least the currency component that was outstanding? It was zero, and the inflation stopped. Interesting. So inflation was growing so fast that it outpaced the capacity to produce notes by the price. Right. Exactly. Now, the same thing is happening a little bit in Venezuela because Venezuela has, has a mint. It, it is not a high-quality mint. It is fairly dysfunctional. They, they cannot produce domestically Bolivar notes. So they have to buy them from, from one of the note uh, producers internationally. And the problem is they, they haven't been paying the note producers uh, on, in a timely way. So the, the, the houses that are producing the notes and shipping them in are refusing to do so. So, so, that, so they're running into this re-denomination problem. Right? And, 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 and they have a big wheelbarrow problem. To buy the hot dog, you do need it. Right. A lot of Bolivars. You know, in Zimbabwe, and speaking of the wheelbarrow problem, in Zimbabwe I saw a sign of uh, an individual. He held it up and he put starving billionaire. <laughs> he, <laughs> he has, he's, he's a billionaire all right. And they had the Zimbabwe dollar, but he couldn't feed his family. So, yeah, another manifestation of that. Well, by, by, by the way, David, mm -hmm. the, the Zimbabwe thing, now remember that that was, that was a case where, where you went to the extreme, another extreme. Yugoslavia was a physical constraint thing we went through. Mm -hmm. But the Zimbabwe thing was the, the, the citizens simply refused to use the, the Zimbabwe dollar. So spontaneous dollarization that occurred. They, were, they, 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 they refused to use the the Zim dollar for anything 
and and so the government this was in November of 2008 and by January of 2009 the, the game was up and the, and the government had to legally uh, uh, adopt dollarization before that it was all spontaneous but that, that meant le the legal when, it, when the dollar became legal tender and the accounts of the government then were recorded in the US dollars and and now Zimbabwe is dollarized. Yeah, so the government gave up in effect. You know, they could, they could no longer get the money. I, I, there was also, in my understanding, some of the producers of their notes, which were from outside Zimbabwe, also began to kind of push back against the country. But your point is taken that at some point they just had to face the reality and they they stopped they 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 stopped you know pursuing more and bigger notes and they allowed people to use the dollar. Uh, this is the, the U.S. dollar. Now, I have, uh, you may as well, I have a collection of notes from that period. I have actually a collection of notes from 2007 through 2008, and you can see the denominations rapidly change over those two-year periods. I mean, I've, they got like a $1, $5, very similar to what we have here in the U.S. in early 2007. And then by 2008, the largest note, of course, is the hundred, famous $100 trillion note. And those things now are actually worth something as a collector's item. Yeah, well, they, yeah, they're worth more now than they ever were in, in reality. So in your table, your Hanky uh, Bushnell table, you mentioned you have a number of countries listed there, and you, some of this information is also in your Troubled Currency Project a website, which we'll also provide a link to. And just you know, just for our listeners' interest, maybe if they're wondering, right now it seems the countries that have been experiencing hyperinflation, have troubled currencies. We've discussed Venezuela as an example. Um, but apparently Nigeria and Syria are also countries with problems. Is that right? Well, uh, not, uh, this, this is, I, I'm going faster than, this will be posted, but actually Sudan, South Sudan, I, I've just looked at, I've just analyzed that, I did a paper on this last week, uh, to examine what, I, I finally got the black market data required to go through the purchasing power parity exercise that I uh, outlined uh, earlier, and and they did not qualify as, a hyperinflation, South Sudan, yeah. They, they've only had two days in which the monthly inflation rate exceeded 50%, but there's still a, the world's highest inflation now is in South Sudan. Okay. Uh, and, the, and the rate's about 300% per annum. Then, then you go uh, to Venezuela, which we've talked about. Uh, it ended last year, by the way, the the annual uh, inflation rate was 290% in Venezuela last year. And, and then you go to Egypt. Hmm. And e e Egypt is running about 140%. Now, it's way higher than, than, than the official statistics, uh, my, my measure. And it, 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 the reason for that, obviously, is that the Egyptian pound has basically collapsed thanks to the advice of the IMF, which they advised them to start floating the currency, and it, it did not float on a sea of tranquility. It sank immediately, and inflation is huge in Egypt, very destabilizing situation there. I, I think they're going down the tubes. Uh, but, but then we, we go to Nigeria. Nigeria is, was in a triple di low triple digits, but it's, it's coming down now, and it's about 60% per annum. Syria is a very interesting case because it, it looked like in, uh, several years ago that it, w it was going to hyperinflate. It never did hyperinflate during the Civil War. And now with the uh, Russians, once, once the Russians entered and, and the tides started turning in the Civil War, I, I monitor the Civil War and what's going on by looking at the Syrian pound and, and calculating the inflation rate. And the inflation rate has come down. It's, it's at the lowest point now it's been for years. It's about 20%. I was looking at your chart, and for Syria in 2013, they, they topped like 350% inflation. But what you're saying is it wasn't a sustained amount? 
to well, qualify uh, it. That's, yeah, that was a, Dave. That was a yearly figure. The monthlies were a lot. Uh, okay, lower. okay. You're basing it on monthly figures as opposed to the yeah, annual. That's that, okay. Yeah, that's that. That first criteria, fifty percent per month. The Kagan. Gotcha. Uh, okay. So it's still it's still pretty large though. I mean, if you're living in oh, Syria yeah. oh, during huge. this time, it's painful. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's huge, and yeah. and and of course, what the reason that that these inflations, you know, it, it's hard to imagine the money supply going up uh, as fast as it's going up. But you have to think in terms of, you always have to think in terms of what's happening to the currency on 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 the black market. That's a free market, and in a place like Syria, what was happening? Well. They they were spontaneously dollarizing the economy. They, no no one uh, the, the, they wanted to get rid of those Syrian pounds like hot potatoes and get greenbacks, and so the Syrian pound that that causes the, the Syrian pound to go down and and weaken, and and it causes the implied hyperinflation uh, or inflation to to increase in a country that's experiencing that kind of thing. So it's a currency substitution that starts coming into play, and and this is how your expectations come in, in these in these very high inflation countries. It is it isn't like, oh, I, they're they're not thinking in terms of Dave the, what is the inflation rate going to be in, in in a month or two? They're thinking about what is the exchange rate going to be tomorrow, and and that's precisely the intuition behind the value of using purchasing power parity to translate the exchange rate changes into implied inflation uh, numbers because everyone, the expectations are all are focused on the exchange rate. Now, it's fascinating. And what these examples show is that there are still many monetary problems around the world. I mean, you listed in you know, South Sudan, Egypt, Venezuela, Nigeria, Syria, that have all struggled with with rising inflation at different times over the past few years, and so it's it's easy here in the U.S. maybe in Europe to think, hey, that's kind of a, a distant historical problem. A few cases like Zimbabwe or Venezuela, but there are a number of places that still struggle with this. Oh, oh this is this is endemic. I, I I've studied I've studied this, and and uh, there there are around a hundred central banks around the world that have, that have performed so poorly that, that by any standard they, they should they, 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 they should have been mothballed and put in a museum years ago <laughs> uh. and, and, and and what do you do then? Well what do you do? you, you use a foreign currency right. or you ha- or you have a currency board one, one of the two but you have to get rid of the central bank. Well this you know reminds me of a conversation I had with some other guests. And that is, you know, the role the dollar plays around the world, and 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 the usefulness it has for these countries that struggle with their monetary institutions. So you're, I'm sure, familiar with some of the calls to get rid of the hundred dollar bill in the U.S. and and some of the large euro notes, but particularly getting rid of the U.S. dollar. There's been some calls lately to get rid of physical cash, and the you know the concern is, well, it it aids and abets crime. There's also the zero lower bound issue. And there, there's, there's a whole long discussion. Maybe we don't want to go in there, but one part of that discussion I think is very relevant here, and that is we provide this medium of exchange to the rest of the world. If we were to get rid of these large dollar bills, what would Syria do? What would people in Zimbabwe do? What would people in Venezuela do? They, they, they depend on this dollar. And it's, it, it says like we provide this public good, this dollar bill, this hard currency to the world. And if we get rid of it, they're going to have a lot harder time finding a, a suitable medium of exchange. Well, that that's absolutely true. I mean, you, more more or less seventy percent of of all the notes, the U.S. dollar notes in circulation, are, are circulating outside the United States. Yeah. So the the critique is that there, it's all for criminal activity. Where I would say, well, no, a lot of it's being used for. These these countries that have dysfunctional monetary systems. This is this is a phony argument of the highest order. Uh, the people writing about this are, are this is economics one one gobbledygook. They have no idea what's going on in the in the rest of the world. Uh, yeah, yes, there is some criminal activity associated with ha- having notes 
euro notes or, or, or dollar notes or you know any kind of note. This this was, by the way, one one of the great train robberies of all times has just been recently in India with the demonetization of of larger rupee notes by by the Modi government, and and that's just theft because it's government sponsored theft. What what Modi did with demonetization in India, but the rationale was exactly the same as as some of these high flutin uh, Harvard professors who are writing about cashless economies and so forth. The the government said there was a lot of theft and 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 black activity going on. It wasn't theft. It was a lot of black activity going on and. In India, with these larger denominated notes, so so they put a number of conditions that if you had a bank account or credit cards or IDs and so forth, you you would take your notes in and 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 get them uh, exchange for new notes, clean notes. The problem is that the most people in India don't even have bank accounts, don't even have identification or anything else, so. All of those poorer people, particularly in the rural areas, were just robbed because they they couldn't exchange their old rupees for new ones, and and so it, it was the most regressive kind of theft on top of everything else. The only ones who could even theoretically do the exchanges were people living in the cities who had bank accounts. But all all of all the peasants, millions of peasants, were were essentially wiped out. We had a discussion about this with uh, Larry White on a previous episode. And, and to Ken Rogoff's credit, because he's one of the big names pushing it, he, he, he says, as well as, as well as Larry Summers, that you know, this shouldn't have been done in India. But still, the, I think the, the critique is that in the case of these countries we're talking about, hyperinflation, the dollar is an important medium of exchange for them when they have no other good substitute domestically. Let's go back to Venezuela for a few minutes in the time we have left. Um, Venezuela itself also did something very similar to India, as you know. They also tried to issue new banknotes and failed miserably. Um, they tried to re-denominate, and they you know, said the $100 uh, Bolivar bill would be worthless. The president said that, but then when people ran to the banks, they didn't have it, and so he had to kind of push back. So he, too, which is interesting— tried to replace a bill and had a, a terrible uh, attempt at doing it. Well, the thing there, it, it goes back to what I was telling you earlier, and that is he didn't have the re-denominated bills to give them, and the reason he didn't have them is that the providers outside the country that, that produce notes <laughs> refused to supply notes because the Venezuelan government wasn't paying their bills. So he's stuck in a bind. Yeah, he, he was he, he was he was caught out because they, they wouldn't deliver the 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 air, airplanes full of new bolivars because he, he wasn't paying for them. Yeah, it's fascinating. Well, it's also interesting in Venezuela is that there's been an increase in Bitcoin trading there. And it'll be interesting to see if that actually can, you know, be used in a meaningful sense. I know that activity is up. I'm not sure if it, it's actually at the point where provides a good substitute. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I really don't consider Bitcoin to be a be money. Okay. It's a, it's a highly speculative asset uh, that uh, as, a, as a unit of account, it's, it's wildly unstable and, and, and so unstable that it's hard to conceive it as being money. So you don't see any prospect for it to really play a large or maybe even any role as a medium of exchange there if, if, the, if the monetary conditions continue to remain unstable? No, I, I don't think it will, okay. which, which, it, which isn't to say that I, I think cryptocurrencies are, 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 will be the way of the, of the future. And, and by the way, uh, particularly, uh, and this opens up a whole new avenue, and that is to, to have a private provision of, of uh, currency uh, via cryptocurrencies and and I think this it ironically you, you you have the the economists beating the drums for cashless economies you mentioned two uh, I won't repeat their names or at Harvard both of them uh, but th this move to cashless 
economies might be the big opening for private currencies. Hmm. In other words, go government government is essentially saying, look, look at India. Would you, would you trust a rupee now? No. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's exactly, you just echoed what I was thinking in my mind. And uh, as a result, w traditionally, of course, they've tried two of these demonetization efforts for exactly the same reason, to get rid of black economy and so forth in India before this third one. And none of them have worked. And, and why do you think gold is such a big deal in India? It's, it's part, partly because of the fact that it, it, it's, it's your expectations thing, Dave. Yep. They expect, the, they expect the, the rupee to be a half-baked currency, which it is, and to lose purchasing power. And, and they would rather have something that holds its value, and that's gold in, in India. Now, what's going to happen in, in a more modern context, instead of gold, you, you, you won't necessarily go into some hyper-unstable thing like Bitcoin, but you go into some other cryptocurrency that, that's going to be coming along and, and, and surely will be coming along and, and be stable. I mean, may, maybe it will be... Uh, tied to some basket of commodities, some, some Leland Yeager kind of basket uh, will provide a stable unit of account for what, what in fact is not, not a note that's being exchanged or a bill, but a, but a cryptocurrency. Well, that's a fascinating thought that these developments in countries with unstable monetary systems combined with the move towards a cashless system maybe the big catalyst needed to really bring out these alternative monetary forms. But, but one, one, one thing, I, let me speak, this is backtracking into the dollar. One, one development most people aren't even aware of is that the, the huge dollarization, informal, unofficial, and in dollarization of Africa, because you, you have electronic banking telephone banking that is spreading all over Africa uh, like wildfire and and all of the the unit of account that is used in that electronic banking and telephone banking and so forth it's the US dollar so the US dollar is becoming not it's not only important uh, unofficially in physical notes but also in in the electronic form in, in places like Africa so these are interesting times for sure. We are out of time now. Our guest today has been Steve Hankey. Steve, thank you so much for coming on the show. Great to be with you, Dave. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.